yeah, my name's Serenity Hill and I, I work with the Open Food Network. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, my farm, uh, which is called Pukawidji. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll start um, with an acknowledgement. I'm on Bangarang country at the moment and uh, sovereignty was never ceded here. And the wealth of the current economies of this land is still based on that land being stolen. I pay my respects and deep gratitude to elders past, present and emerging. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, my farm and the history of kind of thinking and where we've got to in, in the model that we're putting together for that uh, regenerative farm. I'm gonna start by painting um, a picture of this kind of beautiful place and, and what we're doing there. Uh, talk a bit about um, previous work and current work in the Open Food Network and how that's helped um, us think through models um, of collaborative farming and a, and a commons um, system for farming and, and get into some of the nitty gritty of the kind of theory and, and practice around that and then talk about kind of where we're at now and where we're going. So the farm um, is in a place called Warren Bain in northeast Victoria. It's uh, nearly 400 acres, 168 hect hectares, and we run a flock of Aussie white sheep there that we sell directly on the Open Food Network as meat. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful farm with diverse perennial, native perennial pasture, lots of trees, original kind of paddock trees, but lots and lots of trees that have been planted by my parents over um, 40 years before, before we took management of the farm. So we've got this amazing legacy there. There's a lot of habitat, lots of um, native animals and that we share, share the farm with. We have got a burgeoning community at the farm. So we have two other families that live there and three other adults. And we're kind of learning about living together and, and operating as a community and evolving the kind of model um, as we're kind of in it. Um, the, I, it, it's a family farm. Um, so my mum currently owns it and we're going through a, a succession process that I'll, I'll talk about a bit, a bit later. Um, she has kind of an amazing um, vision and, and generosity that we're, we're, we're building off. Uh, the, 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 the driver for me for being a farmer and coming back to the land is about climate change and the hope of regenerating and, and building ecological function uh, in response to that. So that's the kind of core driver of, of, of everything. And I have two little kids with my partner, Kirsten. So they're also central to kind of, you know, me thinking about deep into the future and, and, and what we're doing to support a better future. The holistic goal that we've sort of, is our sort of starting point, Kirsten and I coming into this project that we developed um, with my brother as well, is that we exist to support abundant life and livelihoods by providing healing and nourishment to ecosystems and our community. And we to belong and become in a beautiful and vital landscape. So, and, and that will be evolved, that holistic goal with the community that, it, that is living at the farm now. So how did we kind of get here? So Kirsten and I, um, we looked at coming back onto the farm a decade ago, but we could see the structural issues that my parents had dealt with in terms of wanting to do the right thing by the land and, and build ecological function in the land, but um, having to drive the land harder than they wanted to because of the commodity markets that they were selling into. So I had to have more animals than than they wanted to basically and this is a structural issue so we we looked at this um, more broadly we could see the problem and we started a long story short <laughs> we started the open food network which is a um, online platform um, for selling local food and and, and assists transparent supply chains um, and and the core thing about open food network that's different to other kind of online e-commerce things is that it enables farmers to work together enables players in values-based supply chains to, to collaborate and work together. And we started that right from the start with some very strong principles. It's open source, um, it's networked, distributed, 
uh, a few other different things. But, but what we've learned from that is that we, we set the principles and when then we let go and we kind of trusted. And because of the structure of the, the commons and thinking about Open Food Network as a commons and, and protecting it as a commons and then inviting people to come into it, we have had this amazing experience where now Open Food Network is... Um, is, is run by a, in a distributed way with, with non-profit organisations in about 20 different countries. And we all collaborate on this common um, infrastructure to support better, better food systems. So we had that kind of learning and then we're like, okay, <laughs> now we wanna um, come back to the farm. Um, so, so, so some other things that we learned from that, so that setting that sort of, that big vision principles at the start but an, a, enabling enough like letting go enabling enough openness and um for that to evolve with the participants of that that commons at, as it kind of developed we also learned about being pragmatic about resources you can have this amazing like utility you util, um utopian kind of ideas but you need to bring resources from the outside kind of capitalist economy um into this, this new model of, of, of what we're doing. I've heard a, a word a long time ago called transvestment to describe that thing of like, how do we bring resources from the, from the outside economy to make good things kind of happen? So we've learned a lot about how to do that because software is very, very expensive. And, and understanding this viability gap, this is so um, for regenerative farming, but for like better food systems, more generally, we're internalising all the costs that the industrial system externalises. So there's this viability gap that has to be filled somehow um, in terms of, you know, and and this gets down to kind of the pragmatics, like we've set up as a charity, the farm as a charity, because we're like, we want to be able to get grants and things to, to kind of um, support the, the business model of the farm um, and have diverse kind of... Um, um, uh, resource, resources coming in. So coming back to the farm and through all that kind of learning and open food network, there has been three kind of key influences of mine um, and, of, and of Kirsten's. So the first one is the idea about the commons, of a shared resource, this, this space between public and private where, where the participants um, determine what ha what happens with that commons and 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 govern that commons um, and very very influenced by Michelle Bounds and the, and the P2P foundation um, and commons transition over kind of many years and I suppose it, it's almost easier or it is easier with the open food network it's like a knowledge commons and now we're kind of getting to like what does this mean when it's concrete land land and 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 capital kind of infrastructure. It's a it's a whole other same principles, but but a whole other beast. Um, <clears throat> secondly, David Graver has been really influential um, to to me. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, he he's a or was a, an anarchist um, anthropologist and studied many many cultures all over the world. And what I've kind of learnt from David is that you know we create the cultures that we want so there's a there's a kind of mainstream default culture that is you know so damaging and and violent and and we want to create um cultures that work differently to that value value flows are different what we value is different how we how we work is different and the rules of those cultural and and economic flows are different so um, Graver talked about there being three patterns of relationship. Um, hierarchy, where it's the rule of tribute. Exchange, which is reciprocity. So you give me this and I give you that. And then communal relations that run on the rule of take what you need and contribute what you're able. And what's happening in the kind of outside economy is that communal relations are like restricted basically to your immediate family and even you know with kids doing jobs for pocket money and you know we're even um eating away at that and then and then there's a huge amount of exchange and a huge amount of of hierarchy and what what we want to do is create a culture where that's flipped on its head like hierarchy is still useful like if a fire's coming and you want to organize you want to know you know who's going to do what um and exchange is still still useful like we sell the food um but but it's kind of it's shifting the balance of those those patterns of relations to have the communal relations being the dominant 
Um, and the other person that's been really influential for me is Meg Wheatley. Um, and she sort of asks us to, you know, give up on hope and, and act where you are. Like, um, you know, the, the arrogance of thinking that we can, you know, plan to kind of change systems. But what we need to do is create islands of sanity, which are based on the ideas of whatever the problem, like community is the answer and do what you can with what you have and, and who you are. Um, and, and take long-term vision. Like it's, it's about the, thinking about the farm and where we're going. Like we have no idea what we do um, and what the, the impact of that is going to be. You can't plan what that impact is going to be in these kind of complex systems, but you can act with integrity um, every day and have a long-term, you know, the, the impact might be in like 700 years. Um, early in this year, I did um, what's called a vision quest, which I would recommend to everybody. And I got through that a very, very strong um, image that leads us um, and, and guides me in, in what I'm doing. And the image was of a nest. Um, it's actually a nest that uh, someone found it at the farm where it had two very strong crossbones underneath to undergird it and then the sticks and then the kind of soft feathers in, inside. And I'm using this as a metaphor for everything that I do in terms of creating um, the soul, having the importance of community and the soul, um, which is the, you know, the fluffy bit in the middle, and then the importance of everything with that we're doing, building ecological function. So that's the kind of the soil and, and, and that's represented by the, the main part of the nest and then sovereignty underneath, which is represented by the bones. And this is when we're creating these new cultures, we can't forget that we have to put in place the protections, the legal structures um, and, and, and kind of resources that enable us to um, know and, and, and keep that kind of land in common ownership. And we have to be really pragmatic and, and have our eyes open to how the external system works and to, because it's no use trying to create these things if they're going to be shut down. So at the farm, the problem we were solving, which I, I talked about before, um, climate change, but more specifically in terms of land access in designing these kind of polycultural um, regenerative systems, they're often labor intensive. So it's not just like one farm, the, the potential on kind of 400 acres to have multiple kind of um, enterprises that are all um, interrelated and, and amazing, um, it is not gonna happen with just one family or, or one person. So how do we create workable structures for land sharing and collaboration? And then the second problem is, um, about, or the third one, is about land custodianship. So new farmers currently with, you know, land prices and land access, it's like unbelievable and the major structural issue to, to shifting to more regenerative food production. And, um, you know, there's some solutions where it's like older farmers will, you know, have a partnership agreement or something with younger farmer, but there's still this asymmetry of power and, and insecure land. And tenure and and farming is different to a to a normal job like to have deep you, you have a deep sense of custodianship and long-term relationship with that land and, and you can't have that in in some of those other structures so we we were looking at how do we create a common structure um, that will uh, you know a, enable that sort of relationship of different people to come onto the land so the legal model that we've come up, we're in the process of doing succession planning with my mum and we've been guided by a lawyer called Matt Brogan. He's been amazing. Um, so mum has had four requirements kind of going into what this model is. Um, and her, uh, so basically that she has her retirement funded, that my brothers and I have a right to reside on the land and the land is used for proper food production and uh, the ecological value and biodiversity is protected and enhanced. So we set about creating a model that would work for us. And this is not gonna be like, you can't take a cookie cutter thing. Every family and every situation is sort of different, but what it looks like is um, a nonprofit um, charity. We've, so we've set up a nonprofit charity um, for, for Pakawiji. Paku, um, there's a, there's a, a family trust 
and the family trust builds in those principles and then has a long-term lease of 80 years with the non-profit charity and it builds in requirements for that charity to work to do to do the things that mum kind of wanted um, but most importantly to build ecological function through food production and if it does that over the 80 years the equity is slowly transferred and finally ends up um, after the 80 years fully in that in that um, in that charity um, so that's <laughs> that's the very kind of basic outline of of kind of what we're doing we we decided with the charity we've set it up as a company limited but by guarantee we looked um, really early into should we set it up as a co-op like a multi-stake co-op co and we've decided to go with a more generic kind of structure non-profit structure so that the community as it's growing and building and as other people kind of come in can kind of create what that governance looks like within the within that structure like how we make decisions together and and how we actually kind of manage this land together so that so that that can be built by the community instead of you know taking a, a structure like um like a co-op structure which is sort of already determined what the kind of um rules are around that um so that's where we kind of we're kind of at um we, we the 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 other family, one of the other things that we're kind of doing um, on the land is, oh, well, the kind of, there's this sort of like building community at the same time as building kind of what the farm looks like. So the people who are living at the farm are living in tiny houses and we've kind of, you know, adapted a shouse um, as our initial common house, but we, we hope to in the future have a big kind of common house and that's, that's um, how we'll manage the kind of regulations around that. Um, and basically we're just, you know, at the start of this <laughs> big adventure and really want to be um, connecting with other people who are doing similar things and, and learning about what this could look like. Uh, I suppose the last thing that I would say uh, is we, central to what we're doing as, as a community is uh, learning um, collaborative learning with the kids. So we're doing collaborative homeschooling and, and we plan to have nature-based programs um, for kids and, and, and families and that being like a really, really central and core part of what we're doing in terms of um, building a regenerative culture and enabling access for a whole lot of other people to come and kind of experience this different way of um, operating and, and and being and, and get healing from, from uh, the country. And so it's not just about the people who are working on the farm or part of that community that lives there. There's this broader sense of, you know, someone might come for once a year and stay and still have a deep ongoing connection with, with that land. Um, they might buy our food or, you know, participate in the pro. There's, there's, there's other opportunities for people who aren't directly involved to be part of that community and to be healed by that and to, to learn um, from that. Yeah.